for me, it was living proof that God keeps his promises. I had waited a lifetime for the hope of the world to arrive. And just when it seemed that the prophecy would die along with me, I heard the cry of salvation coming from, from an obscure little town. The only thing more powerful than expectant hope is fulfilled hope. It gave me permission to die in peace, but more importantly, it gave people everywhere the possibility to live with peace. He was a constant reminder that God does not make mistakes. I didn't believe that at first. Everything started out so wrong. People told me I was a fool, blind to the truth, too trusting for my own good, but deep down in my soul I knew something special was happening. Something bigger than my fears. Something better than my plans. Someone greater than my doubts. He was a threat to my throne. My kingdom had been built by my own hands. And now there was a claim that a child had been born who would be known as the King of Kings? Not if I had anything to say about it. So I went after him. There was no way I would bend my knee to another. A child at that. If he wanted my throne, he would have to do what I did. He would have to take it. He served as the pathway to wisdom and knowledge. Some have called us wise men. Nothing could be farther from the truth. The king used us like puppets to carry out his devious plans. Yet in the midst of our blindness, God gave us a beacon of light, a heavenly compass that pointed us towards an incomparable gift containing the depths of God's riches. To think that we brought him gifts seems so laughable now. He was the gift to us. He was the reassurance that God could still use anyone. As an innkeeper, I had welcomed many weary travelers before, but none as tired as that young couple. With no room to offer, I was ready to send them on their way when I noticed the woman was close to giving birth. I offered them the only place I had, a manger. It seemed like such a trivial act at the time, but I soon realized that I had played a part in something much bigger than myself. God had chosen me, too. He was the answer to every question I had ever asked. Why me? How could this happen, you know? What will people think? My journey began with confusion and, and fear. Slowly, with each passing day, I, I came to see the beauty and the blessing of God's presence as my son grew inside of me. It was a strange mixture of human limits and divine love, culminating in that one moment when I saw his face for the first time, and I realized God was with us. was the good news we never knew existed. When you guard sheep for living, any distraction is welcome. But that night was more than we could have ever hoped for. The silence gave way to the sacred. The simple gave way to the supernatural. The bleeding of sheep gave way to the crying of a child. For a world in need of joy, for the earth in search of peace. It was such good news that we could not help but spread the word. A savior had been born.
My name is Dawn Sidstelin, and I work here at Hillcrest with Student Connections. So about 20 years ago, um, there I had was having a routine eye exam, and they noticed something unusual in my eye, and it was kind of a wrinkle in the retina that they didn't understand, and there was some kind of inflammation, and at the time I wasn't really that worried about it, um, but over the years it's progressed and I've had nine surgeries on my eyes and um, the vision that I have is being maintained with steroid injections um, because it's a disease of of the eyes that's slowly taking my eyesight. In the beginning I think I felt a lot of uh, panic. A lot of the times it dealt with losing spots of vision or losing periphery or losing center vision, different things, and sometimes medication would bring it back or make it better and sometimes it wouldn't, but it's progressively gotten worse. There was a lot of fear involved and a lot of anxiety, and early on I determined that I really needed to be at peace about what was going on with my vision because the doctors didn't know exactly. It doesn't really still have a name. It's idiopathic, which means they're not sure what it is, but they know what it's doing. And I knew that the key to me surviving this trial, however long it lasts, or if it's the rest of my life, is that I'm at peace. So the next song that the choir is going to be doing is called The First Noel. And Noel is the French word for Christmas. And I think back on what the first Christmas must have been like. Um, I know that it was during a time that the Romans occupied Israel and there hadn't been prophets speaking to the people for hundreds of years. It had been silence. And it was a dark time and a time of insecurity and hopelessness. And I think when the angels came and they told, you know, Jesus is born and joy to the world and peace to the earth and all of these things became a reality um, in a broken, dark world that the light came. And I think about that in terms of what that looks like for me. Um, I know that darkness and lack of vision and things from a physical standpoint can be a frightening thing, but I know that Jesus came to bring light and that someday everything will be restored, um, including my, my vision. And I, I think and I look ahead to what heaven will be like when I get there and my eyes will be restored in a way that they haven't even been on earth. I believe that we're going to see color we never saw and um, just seeing Jesus is going to be a glorious, glorious day, and I just look forward to that with just anticipation and excitement. First Noel, and then for us, the next Noel that will be with him in person.
I'm Steve Unseth, and I teach at Hillcrest. I've been there a very long time. 24 years ago, um, we had to bury our son. Uh, Joseph had cancer, and he died before his fifth birthday. For a parent to, to say goodbye to your child at any time, no matter what age, it's just it's not a natural thing. And so God has used Joseph in our in our life to remind us of well, really of God's love. I've had people ask me, um, how can you believe in a God who let your son die of cancer when he was four? 
And my response is, how can I not believe in a God who let his own son die for me and for Joseph? And so one of the things that Joseph's death drives us to, drove me to, is do I really believe the promises of God? Redemption story, which is talked about in the next song that uh, the choir is going to sing, it comes in the midst of winter snow, and of course we don't know when Christmas really took place. Um, probably wasn't in the winter and there probably wasn't any snow. But the picture there is metaphorical, I think, at the darkest times of our life, the coldest times, the times when we're maybe feel the furthest from God, that's when he comes down. God didn't create a world of death and decay and cancer and disease. He created a world that's perfect. And the song that we're going to hear also talks about the, the redemption story that's been told from eternity past. And God knew before even creation what it would take to repair the damage that, that we would bring into the world. And the first promise to Adam and Eve was given 4,000 years before Jesus came. And so there was a long waiting period between the promise of the deliverer and then when the angels sang in Bethlehem and said, you know, praise be, this is the glorious morning, the dawn that has been foretold for thousands of years. And when Jesus was on earth, he gave a similar promise. He said, all right, I'm going to leave you, but I'm going to go prepare a place for you. Uh, that where I am, you will be also. We've been waiting about 2,000 years for that promise, and it may be another 2,000 years before that promise comes true, or maybe, you know, this Christmas season. We don't know, but the fact is, we know that God's a God, of, he, he's a promise keeper. And uh, so when I think about my son Joseph now, I don't think about, you know, the cancer that was racking his body and the pain and his last days where he, could, he couldn't even walk anymore. Uh, now he's running and jumping and in a delightful place. And one of the, one of the benefits of, of having a loved one in heaven, I think, is to remind us that God has prepared us for something beyond this earth that gets our eyes off, you know, the snow that covers us from day to day on earth, the pains of this earth, and reminds us uh, there's a place where further up and further in, as Lewis talks about in the, in the Chronicles of Narnia, where every day we go further up and further into to what God has prepared for us.
Well, welcome. Glad that you are here with us tonight as uh, the Hillcrest choirs and musicians uh, present to you Anticipate Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. The Christmas concert is a long standing tradition here at Hillcrest. It's part of uh, what we enjoy and look forward to as we get to usher in the Advent and Christmas seasons with, with songs of hope and songs of faith and songs of joy and songs of love that, that point us uh, to our Savior. They're songs of gospel. And it's our prayer that as you hear these songs tonight, as you watch uh, these paintings being painted, the paintings are of, of uh, Anna and Simeon as Mary and Joseph have brought Jesus into the temple. And they've been waiting for so long as you see these paintings coming to life before you, as you hear the testimonies that have been shared of, of waiting and anticipating what God would do. It's our prayer for you tonight that the Holy Spirit the same Holy Spirit that was ministering to Simeon would minister to you tonight as you hear these songs of hope and of faith. The hope that we have. Have you ever heard or used the phrase, wait for it? Maybe somebody was telling you a joke or, or showing you a video or telling you a story and as the story is building and they're getting to the, what's going to be the good part and you want them to tell you right now and you're, they're like, wait for it. It always goes like that, right? Wait for it. And then they tell you the punchline, or they tell you that the hero has, has conquered the villain, or whatever the, the, the culmination of that story is, and, and you're glad that you've waited for it, because you kind of celebrate in that moment. Wait for it. You don't like waiting. Little children on a road trip from the backseat of a 1971 Ford Country Squire station wagon green with wood paneling on the side. <laughs> it was also a gift to my sister when she went off to college, so I dodged that bullet. <laughs> but as a little one in the back seat saying, every time we get in the car, as soon as we got out of the driveway, as soon as we got out of the driveway, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Five kids asking two people, are we there yet? My father being a bit of a uh, existentialist would say, oh, Brad, you can never be there because you'll always be here. <laughs> you start thinking about that. It's just a quiet ride after that. <laughs> he was a smart man. <laughs> hungry children or a hungry family as the day has wore on and they walk into a house and they can smell what's, what's cooking. What time will dinner be ready? I remember one mother would say this to me, wait till your father gets home. Six of the, e these are either the most scary words to a child <laughs> or the most reassuring words to a child. Sometimes it was because there had been a phone call home, wait till your father gets home. But sometimes it was something that was delivered, news that was delivered to my mom and wait till your father gets home, he's going to be so glad to see you. Sometimes it was something that maybe I had broken, a toy or something, and I, I didn't know how to put it back together again, and I would try. But see, the great thing about my father was that he could fix anything. Wait till your father gets home. He'll fix it. Waiting is hard. But then in a serious sense, some of us wait for some really heavy things. Not when we'll get to our road trip. Not when dinner will be ready. Not when dad comes home. When will my suffering stop? I'm bearing a pain. I'm bearing sorrow. I'm bearing hurt. I'm bearing shame. I, I, I've been tossed aside. I've been neglected. I've been looked over. I've been ignored. I've been hurt. I've been the target. When will this end? <laughs> Waiting is hard. All of those questions reveal a yearning of our heart, doesn't it? It reveals a, a hunger and a thirst and a weariness and, and an anticipation for something better that something needs to come. Something needs to bring relief, satisfaction for the hunger. A weariness uh, of our soul that maybe cries out for rest. Habakkuk 2.3 says this. 
It talks about the promise of the Messiah, that, that 600 years before it was fulfilled, Habakkuk wrote this, for still the vision awaits its appointed time. There's a time that's appointed when the vision, when the prophecy will be fulfilled, but we're waiting. He says it hastens to the end. It doesn't feel like that. He says it will not lie. And if it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come, and it will not delay. Wait for it. Don't lose hope. Don't give up. You're not forgotten. God has not forgotten you. God has not left you. God has not abandoned you. The story of Simeon. The Bible tells us that he was a man who was righteous. He was a good man. But he lived in a time, at the end of a time, that theologians call the, the, the silent years. There hadn't been a prophecy. God hadn't spoken through a prophet to the people. And it seemed hopeless. But was it? Look what we read in Luke chapter 2 about Simeon. It says there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation. We wait for consolation, right? Of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit to the temple, and when the parents brought the child to Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms, and he blessed God and said, Now you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation for the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And it says that, that the parents marveled. <laughs> God hadn't been silent. God had been speaking through his word. Maybe God feels, maybe feels that you wish God would speak. He speaks to us through his word. He speaks to us through his Holy Spirit that, that God's word says reminds us of the things that we have read and we have heard in the word of God. God was not silent. Simeon was righteous. He was devout. He was waiting for consolation. It meant that he was a person of hope. He was a person of faith. He was persevering because he believed God's word at the appointed time. And in that moment, what Simeon realized is what we can realize too because the promise of Jesus has been delivered. When he held the baby, the baby that would bear his sin. When he blessed the baby who God said would be a blessing to all of the world in his promise, he said, I can go now, God. I've got peace. Thank you. And so to the suffering, to the yearning, to the thirsty, to the tired, to those of us who wait, to those of us who yearn, this concert tonight is pointing us to Jesus Christ. These words that we've read tonight point us to Jesus Christ who came, Emmanuel, God with us. You're not forgotten. You're not forsaken. God is with you in Jesus. And he said, I, I got to go, but I'm going to leave you the Holy Spirit. That same Holy Spirit that ministered to Simeon in what seemed like a dark time is the same God and the same Holy Spirit that ministers to us. God came to the rescue to save. Tonight, um, we want to give you an opportunity uh, to come alongside our, our ministries here at, at Hillcrest. Um, just a minute, we're going to take up uh, an offering. And uh, that's to help support our spring choir tour. I was thinking about this the other day, that the spring choir tour in the 70s when we had that station wagon <laughs> was the first time I had any understanding of what Hillcrest was. My family had a, a, a couple of students from, from Hillcrest, and they came to our house, and they were so cool because they were in high school. And it was even super cool because we got to stay up late and have ice cream <laughs> and talk about this place called Minnesota where it was cold. <laughs> well, not at all like the glorious place of New Jersey. 
Anyways, <laughs> we're going to invite you tonight to, to come alongside Hillcrest in, in this way. To, uh, the offering that we're going to receive tonight is going to, um, to help support the choir tour. And the choir tour is also that we can go out and talk about who Jesus is. That's one of our extensions of what we do here at Hillcrest. I'm going to invite the ushers to, to come. We're going to receive the offering. The worship team will also be uh, leading us as well. I do want to let you know, too, that following the uh, choir concert tonight, as you leave, the National Honor Society will be... Hold up, guys. Wait. So I'm going to pray. Um, I just got to keep talking, right? I'm sorry. Um, the National Honor Society will be in the, in the foyer there, and they're doing a fundraiser. It's a pie social, and there's a suggested donation. If you want to just go home with a whole pie, that pie is $15. If you want to have a slice, 3 bucks. If you didn't come prepared for that, will you just enjoy with us? Um, and with that, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gospel. Thank you for uh, your Holy Spirit that ministers to us in seasons of difficulty, in seasons of waiting. And Father, in the midst of that, we can have joy and we can have hope and we can have life and love. Father, we thank you uh, tonight that we can celebrate our Savior. Thank you for forgiveness of sin that is ours through faith in him. And so, Father, to you tonight, will you be glorified in this place? It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.
the Son, who existed always and forever in perfect communion with God the Father, was preparing to step from heaven onto the earth below. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. So Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth to Bethlehem, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no room in the inn. The angels were wide-eyed as God's perfect and mysterious plan of grace began to unfold. On the earth below, only a few were wide-eyed. Men who worked in the open fields, shepherds, and wise men who traveled from the far east, both stared up at the wonders in the night sky. Oh, 
now as the choir transitions into the aisles, join us for one last song as we sing Come Thou Lawn, Expected Jesus. I think I uh, noticed something very palpable in the room. You've been wanting to clap all night, right? <laughs> all right, let's just say thank you to our musicians. <laughs> and also to our, our artists. We have Sylvia and Kyle and Jack. Thank you for your paintings tonight. We appreciate that. Um, yeah, fuck you. Yeah. We also want to uh, say thank you for coming tonight. We want to say thank you to Bethel Lutheran. Uh, they are such gracious hosts for us for these kinds of events. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Church, for for welcoming us into your beautiful sanctuary for a night like tonight. Uh, following the, the concert, uh, you are again invited out to uh, have a piece of pie or take home a pie uh, and uh, help out the National Honor Society that way. I'm going to invite you to stand and, uh, and to receive a benediction that is very fitting at Christmas. And uh, hear these words. These are God's good words to us today. And they can send us out with peace the way Simeon uh, was sent out with peace. And now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Go in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, thank you, choir. Right? And then you just felt like, oh yeah. Wasn't that fun? <laughs> 